chairing this session uh, with my colleague Masood Pravarni. He is from University of Utah. He did a presentation earlier. Um, the title of this session is Emerging Topics. We have five presentations uh, this afternoon, and they, each presentation, as um, like other sessions, will be 15 minutes. So uh, two minutes to the, the end of 15 minutes, we will just show that. That means you can get ready to get to your conclusion. So our first presentation is going to be uh, presented by Thomas uh, Valencia Zulaga. He is going to talk about sizing co-located storage for uncertain renewable energy sold through forward contracts. Yes. OK. Thank you. My name is Tomas Valencia. Uh, and I'm going to present a, a, a model that we've been working on the supervision of Professor Shmuel Oren at UC Berkeley, uh, sizing co-located storage for uncertain renewable energy sold through forward contracts. So we might be in for the competition for the longest title, after all. Uh, <laughs> So quickly, what I'm going to do is, to as an introduction, I'm going to talk about the setting uh, in which we presented the model, then quickly describe the key features of the model, uh, and, and then finally, before concluding, show you some numerical results. So let's get started. Uh, our physical setting that we're considering is a wind power plant that has battery storage system located at the power plant. It is something that we're seeing more and more of uh, as uh, cost of battery has been decreasing. Uh, just to get some the, the, the key idea here is that the, the injection of the, of the power plant is perceived as a single injection by the power grid. And just to get some notation out of the way, I'm going to consider injection of, uh, of the battery positive when it's coming into the battery. So what the power grid perceives is just the difference of the wind power output and the battery injection. So that's the physical setting. For the financial setting, we're going to consider that the wind power plant has an energy commitment, we call Q. Uh, so this is some energy that is responsible for, at say, certain a period. And for this commitment, the, they're going to receive some income at a fixed price P, so the income is going to be P times Q. Of course, since the wind power output is uncertain, we have three cases. First, if the wind power output is equal to the commitment, then nothing happens. They just receive their, their income, that's it. If the injection is less than the commitment, then we have a shortfall. Uh, and they're going to have to pay a penalty, a, a shortfall penalty and imbalance, which we're going to call in here xi minus. Uh, and finally, if the injection is higher than the commitment, then you have some surplus. And we're considering that uh, the, the, they might sell this surplus uh, and receive an award for this, for this surplus energy, and this is this award xi plus. Of course, this could also be a penalty, and we, we, we would do that just as, uh, assigning a negative uh, sign to this, to this, uh, uh, to this award. Uh, and so putting it all together, well, our, our setting is that the profit at some period of our wind power plant is given by the sum of three terms, just the, the income which is fixed and depends on the, on the commitment that is made ahead of, the, of production, and then the two terms of, which are imbalanced terms for the shortfall penalty and the surplus uh, award. And if you're familiar with the operations research literature, this is a news vendor model. Only the uncertainty is not on the demand, as in the classic uh, news vendor model. The uncertainty here is on the production, on the supply. And so that's the, our setting. Next, I'm, I'm going to describe the, what the idea of our model is, the, the scope of the model. Uh, in what I just showed, uh, all the quantities had a subscript T, and we do this to highlight the that we keep in mind as we propose this, this, this model, the case where prices are going to vary in time, which is the most interesting case. But for what I'm going to present today, we're going to focus on forward contracts. And that's the case where, where all prices are constant. So the price at which the commitment is, is sold beforehand is constant, is P, and the imbalance penalty and awards are also constant and are psi. This is the case of a wind power producer which commits to sell energy in the forward contract with price P, and hedges its risk, is, is backed up by a pay as demanded forward contract for the negative shortfall, and th this contract is, has a price kappa P, which means this penalty is just proportional to the imbalance with coefficient kappa P, and sells its surplus energy in a pay as produced forward contract with price kappa prime P, which means the, the, the surplus award is, again, proportional to the imbalance. Uh, of course, for this to make sense, we need 
kappa more than one and kappa prime less than one, otherwise uh, the, the setting is not realistic. And the case, an interesting, a common case is the case where you have to spill the excess energy, that would be the case with kappa prime equal to zero. Furthermore, we're going to restrict our analysis to stationary policies. That means where our commitment, when we choose our commitment, is just a function of the price uh, that is offered in the forward contract. And since we're talking about constant price, that means we have a constant commitment queue. Uh, and we're going to disregard other streams of revenue. So there are ancillary services, capacity market, that those are what we usually call the value stack of storage. We're only going to consider the profit that, that I just showed you. Uh, next, was well, the scope uh, of, of the model. This is a model for planning capacity of, uh, uh, of storage. So this is a long-term high-level uh, model, and which we, we're going to use to uh, answer questions like what is the value of storage, what is the optimal storage size, uh, look at some metrics of interest like the expected shortfall, expected surplus uh, of, of energy in the long term, uh, and look at sensitivity uh, analysis of how are, how are these values affected by changes in the parameters. Uh, so with that, I'm going to start look, presenting at the, at the model. So since we're interested in, in this high-level, long-term uh, uh, questions, the, the, what we're going to do, the approach, is we're going to model, the, the only stochastic process that we have in, in the model, since we're considering constant prices, is the wind power output. And we're going to model that as a continuous time Markov chain with a finite state space. Uh, then, since we're only considering the, the, the profit that I just showed you, our goal is to maximize the profit, and we're looking at the long-run average profit, so the infinite horizon average profit in a continuous time formulation, which has this uh, structure. And since utilizing this assumption that we just made of, for, of modeling the wind power output as a Markov chain, we can exploit the ergodicity of uh, Markov chains and express this long-run uh, uh, average profit in terms of limiting distributions, which is what we have here. Uh, and so the key thing here is we have two terms. One is the forward income, which is known before once we choose the commitment and the, and the, uh, from the price P, and the imbalance uh, penalty and award, which brings into two cases, depending on whether storage is available or unavailable. What we mean by that is the storage is available if we can follow our desired charge or, or discharge policy. It's unavailable if we cannot, meaning the storage is empty and we're trying to discharge, or it's full and we're trying to charge. And expressing this, this long-term average profit in terms of, of, of limiting distributions, we have this, the, the, these two terms, storage available and unavailable, and it always gets expressed in terms of the limiting distribution of the continuous time Markov chain, pi, and the, the long-run probability of the limited distribution of storage being available or unavailable, which we call psi. And let's look a bit more at that. Uh, so the, the next thing to do to, to make sense of this expression is to look at what the optimal charge discharge policy is going to be. It turns out that for constant prices, which is the case we're looking at here, the balancing policy is optimal. And this has been proven in a couple of papers. It's also not too hard to convince ourselves that this is true. If prices are not changing in time, there is like no value to uh, store more energy now or, or discharge more energy now than you need to. And what this means is whenever you have surplus energy, you store it. Whenever you have a shortfall, you discharge the battery to meet that shortfall so that you always balance your commitment and your injection. And when you plug in this optimal policy, this means that whenever storage is available, you have no imbalance because you're actually balancing. That, that's what you call a balancing policy. And so you have no uh, a sh shortfall penalty or surplus reward, this term goes, makes, uh, becomes zero. And so your, term, your expression simplifies in the case of uh, constant prices, which is this last line, to this expression right here. Uh, and the only thing we need to evaluate this function is the expression of the long-term long uh, limiting probability of storage being unavailable, psi. So it's, we don't, all we care about is when is storage empty or full and we cannot follow our policy. And so we, how do you calculate this limited distribution of unavailable storage? Uh, I'm going to, not going to the details, but in a nutshell, the idea is we can model the battery uh, using fluid Q theory. And what that means is we can think of the battery as a tank, to which is receiving flow uh, 
at a rate r, so inflow if r is positive or outflow if r is negative. And this rate of flow, inflow or outflow is a function of a continuous time Markov chain, which is what we have here. Our policy r is a function of uh, the commitment q, which is constant, and the wind power output w, which follows a continuous time Markov chain with a, with a gener generator matri matrix q. And it turns out that uh, in this setting with finite capacity b, the limited distribution of the level of fluid in the tank satisfies this differential equation. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the details, but what this means is that we can op obtain the limiting distribution by solving an eigenvalue problem uh, with the matrix Q and the, policy, the candidate policy R by formulating boundary conditions which are not hard to formulate at the, uh, at the, at the state empty and full. And so once we do that, what this means is that for a given candidate policy R and capacity B, we can obtain the long-run probability of storage being unavailable, which is what we wanted for our uh, formulation. And, and so plugging this in, what we mean is from our commitment, we can obtain our balancing policy, and from balancing policy and the size of the storage, we get psi, and we have everything we need for, for our optimization problem, which is to maximize the long-run uh, uh, average profit, which takes this form from what we saw before. Now, when we think about the case with uh, multiple, in general, this is a non-linear, non-convex problem so with, with non-constant <coughs> prices, with challenges of scalability, and we discuss some more about this in, in, the, in our paper. Uh, but for the case that we're talking about here, which is with constant prices and penalties, uh, the dimension of the problem is small enough that we can easily solve this numerically with uh, just uh, with a de decent algorithm with uh, evaluating gradients uh, by differences. Uh, so that's what we're going to do, and, and let me show you that. Uh, so what we did here first, the first test we did is to find the value of storage, and for that we take some historic time series of wind power output from NREL and do two things. In blue is what I just showed you, so we estimate generator matrix Q following a method in, in this paper which uh, just, just does some max likelihood uh, estimation to find the, the, par the transition probabilities of the, of the matrix Q after doing some pre-processing and solve the optimization problem that we, just, we were just looking at. And with that, we can find the optimal commitment and the optimal profit in that, in that case. And in green, to pr provide some benchmarks, some comparison, we solve the ex post optimal problem. So once you have the wind, wind uh, power profile for those whole time series, what would have been the best uh, commitment uh, knowing that, so the ex post optimum. And we do this for, for different sizes of storage, taken as a, as a parameter to obtain a curve. So let's look at that. Uh, so what we're looking at here is just the profits that we obtain, additional profits with respect to the case with no storage for different sizes of storage and expressed as hours of plant capacity. Uh, everything is expressed in per unit, so Prices is just one to make it easy to read. And three cases, there are three uh, features here that are worth uh, discussing. So the first one, we find that the additional value of storage has uh, decreased in marginal value, which makes in economic intuitive sense. Uh, we have a good fitness with respect to the empirical exposed uh, 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 re result, which is reassuring. Uh, and we're comparing this with the benchmark of uh, the feed-in tariff, meaning what, w what would the wind power plant receive if it, would get, it, it could get the price P any time that power is generated. So this is like the, <coughs> the best case scenario for a wind power plant, which was common in Europe at the, at the start of the renewable energy. Thank you. Uh, and what we can observe here is with, if, even with very large uh, storage, we get a gap which is attributable to the inefficiencies in the energy uh, in the charge and discharge. In what I showed you earlier, I was disregarding efficiency for like, clarity of, of, of exposition, but our model does consider these inefficiencies. And since we have this decrease in marginal value, we can easily find the optimal storage just by finding the point where the marginal cost of storage is equal to the marginal value of, of storage. And we can also find the critical value, so at the slope at the origin would be the, 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 value, the cost of storage at which uh, it is no longer profitable to, to install it. We can also look at the optimal pledge. This is quite intuitive in this case. We're looking at, as we have more storage, the optimal 
commitment of the, of the wind power plant as closer to the average output, which, uh, would, which means the, the, the power plant is firming its output equal to its average value. That makes intuitive sense, and it's, uh, again, we have good feelings with the empirical result. And finally, we can look at some metrics of interest, such as expected uh, shortfall, everything quite intuitive here. As we have more storage, the expected shortfall goes, uh, decreases. The expected surplus is not that easy because commitment is also decreasing, so we have a, a trade-off there. Uh, and as I was talking about this critical value, so the value of storage start, at, at which it, it begins starting uh, interesting to install it. And with this data that we, that we were using, we found that the, the, with the reference value we were using before, which is 35% more expensive to, to have uh, this forward contract for the short penalty, that covers the, the short penalty, it wouldn't be worth it to, to install storage. And under this model, you would, have to, you would need to have a price of this penalty, so that the, the cost of this forward contract would have to be five times more expensive than the, your main forward contract for storage to be worth it, which is way too high given nowadays uh, value of, of storage. And, and finally, uh, we can also look at sensitivities, and there's not much to see here or, always other than to say we can quantify this, this, these values of what is the optimal storage for different values of the price of the forward kappa for the shortfall and of the, and the factor kappa prime for the uh, surplus uh, uh, reward. And then to conclude, uh, we have have here a high-level model for planning capacity of storage for wind power plants. Uh, according to the, what the, the results that we have, the, under this setting, the wind power plants are not exposed to enough uncertainty to justify installation of storage, so we need to consider additional uh, stack values of storage or expose them to more uh, uncertainty, which would come through variable prices, and so it makes sense to extend this model to variable prices, keeping in mind the problems of scalability and the validity of modeling this joint stochastic process as a Markovian, which is what we do. Thank you. So we have one quick time for one question. Anybody? Yes. Uh, please, uh, if you can introduce yourself at the microphone, that'll be great. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, Paul Unsu from Columbia University. Uh, so I want to ask about um, first the use of the Markov process. Uh, is that, uh, you know, the continuous time Markov process, is it used more for simulation to evaluate storage value or are you, uh, are, are you solving any stochastic optimization here? So we are solving a stochastic problem, but not in, in the uh, current uh, usual uh, <coughs> Uh, formulation that, that we usually think of as multiple scenarios and assigning probability to each scenario. Uh, our stochastic problem, the objective value, we express it in terms of of the different states of the Markov chain and in terms of the limiting distribution. So that's like the, what's different about this formulation. Okay. Uh, and so we don't do like simulations of width power time series. We, all, we are only looking at the long term, like the infinite horizon average. Uh, uh, behavior, which we express through these limiting distributions. And so what we, we do is we model the wind power output as a continuous time Markov chain, and by doing that we can express the long run, uh, like infinite horizon average uh, profit in this form. And we don't need to like, actually look at the probabilities of the individual scenarios. So the, so the infinite horizon uh, average is done by analytical deviation or it's not, yeah. not through simulation? No. Yeah, there's no simulation. This is an analytical uh, yeah, derivation of the, of the. And then in the analytical um, expression, how do you deal with the storage um, constraints on the state of charge? Because I think that's usually the difficulty when you try to get anything analytical for storage. So for this, in, the, in this current uh, formulation, we're not considering limitations to say uh, like ramping constraints, which okay. means assuming that the, 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 in terms of power, it's enough to. Uh, charge or discharge at full plant capacity. In terms of the storage being full or empty, we model that through this fluid queue theory. So okay. uh, it's, been, it's usually used in, in like communication network uh, literature. They use this for, for router, for modeling routers and how that behaves. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll take for more questions at the discussion. Thank you.
So good afternoon, everybody. So, um, oh, okay, thank you. So I'm here to introduce actually uh, uh, Kumar, who is going to <laughs> Ganesh, who is going to present next. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> they already know you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, so yeah, I'll be the next presenter. In the uh, Dulip uh, Madhura Singha is my PhD candidate, and he's not able to be with us at this meeting. So I'll present his work. Title Identification of Substation Configurations in Modern Power System Using AI. The presentation is outlined as follows. <coughs> a brief quick introduction to the topic and a quick brief overview of the substation circuit arrangements and then how do we apply two methods of AI to, ca to imp carry out substation configuration ident identification and some typical results and a few more remarks to conclude. So, Obviously, I think you know, everybody here knows how the power system is evolving with a lot more penetrations of renewable energy sources, uh, different kinds of markets coming up, demand response programs, um, microgrids, uh, many microgrids and network of microgrids coming up, connecting to the uh, sub-transmission. And of course, you know, breaker operations will be much more Integrated, uh, again, we heard by storage as well, so a lot of storage integrated with storage technologies at large. Um, and also electric vehicles, uh, you know, parking lots with uh, lots of EVs, uh, smart parks, and so forth. So this will require the power system network topology to, to, be, to, be, to change, uh, to uh, be more very fast changing, uh, even under normal operating conditions. And what we are proposing here is that we, we need a fast, reliable transmission network topology pro processor. And uh, can this be done using uh, measurements from the uh, network? Of course, you know, the TNTP, the transmission network topology processor, is used in EMS applications in different time scales, state estimation, congestion management, uh, dynamic security, OPF transmission switching, and many other applications. So it's very vital to have a reliable and fast uh, transmission network topology processor for both control and security applications, power system operations, as well as power system economics to maximize market uh, uh, implementations, contracts, and so forth. So the current uh, uh, methods of doing this uh, transmission network topology processing is based on SCADA signals using breaker status communicated from substations, basically relay signals. And if you have intentional breaker operations, these are all predefined. And in the case of unintentional breaker op operations, which can be critical, N minus one contingencies are planned or done, studies are done, and there's uh, ways to mitigate uh, and minus one. So malfunctions of breakers or false data injection um, attacks can happen. And if this happens, then of course the, we have false topology um, uh, at the energy control center, which can be uh, critical in many EMS applications that are based on topology processing. Of course, we had a whole session on cybersecurity, and uh, that can cyber, att cyber attacks can provide false network topology as well. So the objectives of this work that we are presenting is basically how can we come up with a substation configuration identification that eventually will lead to uh, a TNTP that's data driven. Basically, we want to use PMU measurements, synchrophases, and the AI approach of physics-informed AI models. So we don't need real uh, large amount, you know, PMU measurement training data, but rather from the physics point of view, we can train the AI models. And the output format should be exactly what we have currently, a bus branch model. <clears throat> and the approach should be quite resilient uh, to measurements as well. So just a quick overview of some of the substation arrangements we are uh, studied in this, for this paper. We have studied three kinds of uh, substation <coughs> circuit arrangements. Uh, the MTBA, that's main transfer bus arrangement, the ring bus arrangement, and the single bus arrangement. So, you know, the, this is the simplest, you know, basically uh, two buses and you have ABC breakers that can separate them. 
And the ring bus, basically, more redundancy. Uh, and you can hear it's just a four node ring bus, but that can be n node, a single uh, branch, a single bus arrangement with branch uh, branches and breakers there. So in this case, we only need measurements of voltage at T and M. In this case, we need uh, voltage measurements at all the different nodes. Here we have current and uh, uh, voltage measurements. All this can be obtained from PMU. So we basically did this uh, in the lab uh, at Clemson in the, on a real-time platform where we simulated a two-area form, modified two-area form machine system with PV plants as well as the substations uh, all put in, different kind of substations. And I think in this case we have, for example, here the MTBA at bus 5L, and at bus 5 we have the ring bus arrangement, and at bus 6 we have the single bus uh, arrangement. So the proposed uh, substation configuration identification method is taking measurements, voltage and current phase measurements, and doing some data pre-processing, and we have two AI approaches. One is a logical decision-making LDM, and the other one is a neural network approach. And from that we have, uh, what we get out of that is the substational functional arrangement. And I'll tell you what that functional arrangement means. <clears throat> so substation topology arrangements, in this case, we are looking at the two, basically. One is the component, exactly what the substation circuit arrangement is based on the physical layout, and the other one is the functional arrangement which is based on the basic circuit functionality. So we use, using our AI, we are able to get the functionality, uh, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, and you can see, for example, for the uh, ring bus arrangement here, a four node, uh, any one of these five uh, arrangements basically leads to this functional arrangement. So this is the uh, component, and that's the uh, functional. So for the MTBA arrangement, basically, we can do the logical uh, decision making based on some pre-processed uh, PMU measurements. In this case, we only need two voltages, VT and VM, and we do some pre-processing and we have uh, logical decision making. We can take this to a simple neuron instead of a neural network. Just one single neuron can do the binary classification, uh, whether the MTB circuit breakers are open or closed. <clears throat> Whereas for the ring bus arrangement, it is a little more complex. <clears throat> so uh, here again, we can take voltage measurements and we can do some pre-processing and go through a, an expert system, a logical decision-making system and come up with the functional arrangement. Or we can take the, the voltage measurements, uh, two voltage measurements through for every node, we have a small, compact uh, neural network, multilayer perceptron, um, and uh, it basically can recognize the status of the breaker, and from that, it, it basically um, uh, puts the co configuration together. <clears throat> so what the nice thing about this is that we do not have to train the neural networks based on the PMU data, even though the PMU data is utilized. We all have to do is the neural network has to learn the truth table here, a table like this. So based on this, uh, any substation that depending on, basically we have to develop the neural network for a given type of substation and it can be plugged into any network and it would work. So you, you don't need real physical training data to do this, even though PMU is utilized. And the same thing with the uh, SBA, it's a little more, much more complex here because we, are, we need current measurements as well as voltage measurements. And the same idea here, we can pre-process and we can implement an expert system uh, to do that. Uh, or we can basically take this into multiple, um, depending on how many branches, uh, multiple compact uh, multi-layer perceptrons to basically identify the, the breaker status on each branch. And then we can assemble that together to get the configuration. Again, here we don't need physical training data, it's just the physics. <clears throat> so some typical results here, we have just uh, shown here for the three type of uh, uh, substation configuration, but this has also been done for um, the breaker and half, as well as the double bus, double breaker. So, and these are all very simple uh, number of breakers to show the concept itself. 
So in this case, we have three breakers, and the component arrangements are basically eight different types, but when that reduces basically to two functional arrangements, and the accuracy here is 100% using both methods. The ring bus arrangement, again, there are four, this is a four-node ring bus arrangement. There are 16 uh, component arrangements that reduces to 11 functional, and the accuracy is 100%. The, the, S, uh, the single bus arrangement, there's, here we use six uh, breakers, six branches. There's 64 uh, component arrangement, and here it is still 64 functional arrangement. So the complexity grows as we go to, uh, from this to that. And uh, the other thing to notice is the time. We compared both the expert system, the logical decision making, as well as the neural network. This is in microseconds, so once we have the PMU data. Um, and, and you can see that, of course, the neural network um, is um, faster, slightly faster, I mean, we're talking <coughs> about microseconds here, uh, than, the, than the expert system. Um, and again, of course, the neural network is able to not go through all the each and every decision block, so it's they're much faster, and we, some of these are very compact neural networks, um, like a single neuron can do some of these things. So um, again, just these are more results to show the outcome of the MTBA. You know, some some of the typical case studies we basically eventually for all these different uh, seven different arrangements we end up with a neural network giving us that. In this case, when all the breakers are open, it just gives us that. So eventually, we have to process that to display it visually. <clears throat> it's a building block, and then again the same thing for the ring bus arrangement. So we are building Lego, kind of like Lego blocks. Eventually, this will form the network um, uh, topology in a visualization uh, for the control center. Uh, same thing here with the single bus and different uh, uh, component arrangements. So with that, I'd like to conclude that what we are presenting here or in this paper is a data-driven AI <coughs> approach for s substation configuration identification. It is a physics-based model and the results are basically 100% uh, in this case accurate because we are learning very simple um, physics uh, of, of the circuit um, configurations and the neural network approach is slightly faster than the uh, expert system. And the next step here is to integrate this <coughs> into a full uh, topology network processor by integrating all the substations with the, including branch event identification and then to demonstrate this in applications where high speed and reliable um, network topology uh, identifications will be uh, suited for. Thank you for your attention and I'm two minutes ahead of time. So we can take more questions. Yes. Uh, Kumar, very good presentation, I enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, uh, of the network topology problems we have is that uh, many times, uh, because every breaker has uh, two switches on, on both sides, and we typically don't monitor the switches, so a breaker can be closed and one switch is open, and of course, uh, if we are taking decisions based on the breaker status, the network topology is going to be uh, wrong. Um, uh, uh, I have not seen you included the switches of the breakers. Is it something that can be incorporated there? What will be the, uh, the implication of this? Uh, obviously, the model is going to increase and so on. Yeah, I mean, we can increase the, the complexity. It's a scalable approach. It is basically a physics-based approach, so it doesn't matter. So we are basically looking, we are coming from the functional arrangement rather than the component arrangement. So that's the, uh, our way of attacking, tackling this problem, is from the functionality rather than the component. So yeah, so it doesn't matter whether we have additional switches that we want to include, but the functionality will still be one and the same. You know, we can reduce it to, you know, as we showed in the table for different um, <coughs> different component arrangements, we reduce it to certain number of functional arrangements. So it's again classifying, it's a classification. Yeah, so we are solving it from a functional point, yeah. So actually, uh, you think that the 
finish the early, so we can probably oh, take one okay. more question. So you assume that all three faces are either open or closed together. What if uh, they have one face open and uh, to one of the face got stuck? Is yeah. that a problem in the subcaching? I, I, I would assume that's a yes. problem for any implication. Sure. I think it's a very uh, important problem to address three phase. So this is very early in the work. We wanted to prove the concept that we can now do this for uh, a single line diagram network topology, but of course we have to do each phase. Yeah, you're right. So you're the next presenter. Okay. Ah, somebody's present. Okay. So. Yep. So we have the next presenter, uh, Johannes Stiazny. Uh, are you farmers of DTU, right? So I assume yes. the whole team. So uh, please. Uh, 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 introduce yourself and presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I'm going to present our work on closing the loop, a framework for trustworthy machine learning power systems. And I'm Jochen, uh, I'm a third year PhD student, and together with my colleagues Sam, Rahul, Brynja, and Spiros, uh, we have been doing this work. And we're from the Technical University of Denmark. And actually, Denmark is a very nice place to start because uh, recently, the government and the uh, grid operators uh, decided to build a so-called energy island, which is a project to build large offshore uh, wind farms that are connected on an artificial island and then uh, connected to the mainland uh, via HVDC links. And the big question is, how can you incorporate such an already in itself very difficult system into our power system operation? And a particular problem, of course, is the stability because it's a low inertia or even zero inertia system. And I termed it, it's just a complicated function that we have to evaluate for the subsystem to determine if it's stable or not. And that can take uh, uh, or incur significant computation costs. So what we can do is to actually use surrogates to make this function, appro uh, to approximate this function, to make it faster but also simpler and potentially we can even incorporate it in our operation as a constraint if the surrogate design, how we designed it, uh, allows that. Now, machine learning actually has been uh, evolving over the last years uh, really as a great opportunity for these surrogate functions because it is very fast, very versatile and uh, I mean a lot, you see how much uh, development is going on in the machine learning community. But of course we have the, the well-known challenges of being a black box, it's not very interpretable maybe uh, how it comes to decision and just to train a neural, uh, neural network or a machine learning process is a very complex statistical process in itself already. So this leads to the question really how do we model such surrogates well and maybe even more important, would you trust it in the end? <coughs> And when I think about trust, I actually might look to a standard, for example, ISO standards. And they say on the website, think of them as a formula that describes the best way of doing something. And yeah, can we have an ISO standard for machine learning system and power system? Maybe. I unfortunately can't present you something like this, but what I can present and what the paper is about is really a first step start to think of this machine learning process as a, in a framework and structure our thought and methodological um, <coughs> works in such a framework. So with that we can improve on one hand side the methods really within the process, but also yeah, all our uh, communication also as a community around this problem. Okay, so let's dive first into the standard machine learning process. So this surrogate function, usually what you would do is start to create a data set, then uh, yeah, manipulate your data to prepare for the learning, learn your surrogate and assess it. Now this is uh, associated with a bunch of uh, barriers and really challenges uh, to the problem. We heard about the curse of dimensionality early on, so data set creation in high dimensional spaces is really not an easy task. The pre processing, so which features to select to model your process appropriately uh, is complicated. Your data set has certain characteristics, you need to account for those in the learning process. Then the learning itself, a neural network, 
uh, training a neural network is a high dimensional optimization process uh, problem as, and of stochastic nature actually. And already choosing, for example, the size of the neural network, so choosing the surrogate complexity by far not trivial. And then finally, when it comes more to this trust part, yeah, how reliable is it? Is it just a purely statistical measure that we have? And what are the worst uh, performance or the worst predictions that we can expect? So the, uh, often these are, I would say, in a bit, these modules or different aspects are treated more individually. And I mean, there's great, really great work on all of this. Uh, what we try is maybe more let's interconnect them and try to address by that the challenge associated with that. And it's, uh, it's actually work that we have been uh, doing in the group as a whole. So let's come back to the, the example that I uh, presented to North, or these energy islands. What we want to have is as an input an operating point and then get, for example, our uh, critical dampering ratio. If we now, for example, simply sample operating points, we might get a data or the distribution of the stamping ratio as uh, shown here. Now, the part that we actually care about may sit up around uh, a critical dampering ratio of, let's say, 3% or uh, the narrow range around it. But that's not where the mass of the uh, distribution actually lies. So uh, we get very few data samples. Uh, if our data sets are very large, we get very few um, data samples in this area. And simply by changing the, um, the data set or the sampling method, this also doesn't help us too much, as you can see. So um, if we now fit, feed something in like that into a, um, into a learning model, uh, we can get results as follows. So let me explain. The box plots are 100 repeated runs of this learning process. Since it's a stochastic process, we have to use the different initializations uh, to see how it performs, its reliability performs. So if we simply increase the size of our data set, so from s around 600 to 1300 to 2400, uh, we get better performance, as we would expect. Now, what we uh, show in the paper and uh, how this closing the loop, where this idea comes from, is actually we can use different, different stages throughout this process. We can feed back information in, into the um, data set creation to add some samples. Here, 200, and these 200 samples uh, improve our performance. We can also do use the physical knowledge that we have our system. So it's, it's, uh, we have the model and maybe uh, the underlying equations to that. So we can use that as a regularization term. So to use get to physics informed uh, machine learning and that also can give us uh, performance improvement. Now, this is just a rescaling because so far we have assessed the entire, the, the performance on the entire range of, uh, of the um, input or especially of the output domain. If we look at the subdomain, like the, the small red strip uh, that I showed earlier, we actually get a very different uh, picture where these resampling methods, because they were targeted at specifically that area, they start to perform much better. And we only need 200 points, so uh, much less than increase doubling the number of points. A note, on, uh, or a note of caution here is that it depends very much on the underlying data set that you start with. So I, we used a different uh, starting data set, and suddenly the results look very different. So this, Methods, they interact with each other, and uh, we have to be aware of that. Okay, so that is one, uh, one thing that we discuss in the um, paper. Another thing is uh, what we really don't like about neural networks is uh, that you change the input a little bit, and suddenly your output could you know, change tremendously. So it really has this, uh, let's say, attitude of being spontaneous or unexpected. And uh, what we try here is then to to actually verify uh, that a neural network will behave in a certain way for a given area. How we do that is, so I plot here um, two control parameters which comprise uh, are part of our uh, operating uh, operation point. And uh, the blue area is the stable area, so large damping ratio, and then the red is the um, unstable region. So what we can do is start from um, a white cross, uh, where the white crosses are, um, a certain operating point, and then search from there for the closest point for which the damping ratio goes 
falls below 3%. And this is an optimization problem, and I will uh, explain in a second how to formulate that. Now, when you have found that point, the black point, you can then draw the boundary uh, box, and the region within this box is then what we could call verified. So we know that within this uh, box, there's no prediction um, lower than 3%. And it really has to be stated that that is a rigorous approach compared to doing that statistically. So you can also try it statistically, but you never get this guarantee that there is nothing, uh, not a point in between. Now, this is not ground truth check, that has to be said, but uh, we can even incorporate um, that at some, uh, for some problems. Now, how to do this uh, reformulation? So we start from the uh, learned surrogate model. Now, in our case, and then go to for a formulation. We use here a neural network, so on the left the inputs and uh, on the right the outputs. And the neural network is in the end simply a, um, a cascade of linear transformations shown by the arrows and then a non-linearity, um, the gray circle with the sigma. And for sigma here, we use the so-called rectified linear unit, which is a very common uh, activa so-called activation function in machine learning. And you see it's a very simple function actually. So what we can do with this is to reformulate it as a linear constraint and uh, binary. And that then actually allows us to express the whole neural network in linear constraints and binaries. And we exactly get the same prediction and the predictive cap capability. And then what we can do then from there is draw more arrows and actually assist maybe our data set creation by looking for so-called adversarial examples um, we can help in the assessment of the surrogate, or we can even <coughs> include it in our operation problem. If uh, that's an optimization problem, we can include a neural network prediction into that. So I think that that is pretty cool. Now, you saw that the, the original simple process got a lot more crowded uh, with all these arrows and additional elements, and I bet there is an opportunity for a lot more of those. But of course the complexity increases and that's really not uh, easy to handle. So, because we need to at some point do assumptions and choices uh, in our modeling decisions, but these will eventually create uh, biases and in worst case blind spots so that your model performs badly in a region and you're not even aware that it does. So this is really what we don't want and uh, it's for sure not trustworthy. So I think that's really the case why we need to think more in terms of uh, a framework or structure uh, to be clear about our decisions and assumptions. So, and I think that is actually not that something that, uh, I mean, I practice it my, or I use this paper to, to actually uh, implement that for myself, but I think that's really a job for the community as a whole uh, to, to work on this, that we establish our standards how we want to do it because this goes, can be used in the reporting and the language that we use. So what terminology do we use? There's a lot of terminology coming in from machine learning and maybe it overlaps at some point with our own. Uh, we want to compare papers with each other, but it shouldn't be obscured by using, um, like by the descriptions and then also guidelines. What do we need to see in a paper to make a trustworthy machine learning algorithm? A three, yeah. oh, okay. Um, well, then uh, we have the data set. So we heard it earlier today already. Uh, the results that I showed, this, all these, this process is very, very sensitive on the data set. So it is really imperative that we uh, at least describe the data sets, but uh, ideally open source, of course, what is the basis for um, the results that we obtain. And uh, if you work in a framework, it should be fairly easy to actually interchange uh, a data set with another one that has maybe, maybe slightly different characteristic and you can see if the, uh, if the results square. And there is already initiatives to yeah, create common test uh, sets and common data sets that we can use basically as standards. In the machine learning community, there's competitions on standard uh, data sets uh, and these are really, really popular and um, give a really good benchmark uh, for all academic work then. And then finally, structuring code. I think uh, everyone who has uh, written code, it can help to, to structure it by having a bit of modularity. So 
to say, okay, this is the data sampling process, I can interchange it with, uh, with another, very easily with another um, uh, um, sampling procedure. It, good code practice can make it, our results repeatable, and yeah, also here we should, of course, um, aim for open sourcing them, but it also needs to be, like just uploading code is not helpful if the other people don't understand it. So it really needs uh, a bit of work on that also that uh, other people can use it and it's not you know, just sitting there. So I think if you imagine now 2030, I would say, yeah, I can imagine the first three gigawatt energy island being operational. Will it include a certified machine learning system? I don't know and I think I hope, at least, that we, with our paper, number 57, we could give you an idea where we could, how we could start this process, and yeah, the code is uh, online, and I'm looking forward to discussions. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so, take one question. Thank you, nice, uh, nice presentation. A uh, question about the serial loo and the replacement of, uh, 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 well, I'm guessing you've been talking about training, right? Uh, uh, replacement of uh, real loo by, um, uh, uh, well, linear and, well, MLP, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is not specific to power system. And yeah. this type of question was asked many times, right? So many. I mean, in machine learning community, it was under discussion as per what I know, it's so, disadvantages so to replace, uh, you know, gradient descent by, by what you suggest. So okay. why, why are you playing with it? Okay, then I think uh, I should maybe uh, clarify that a little. So the, the reformulation actually um, is at a stage when the model is trained. So when we're finished with the model training, and then uh, we really uh, want to use this reformulation maybe for so the... So it's not for training? It's not for the okay, training good, process good, itself. Good. And yeah, but it comes from machine learning uh, community like no, 2000. No, no problem, so. thanks. Okay, good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. So, thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Professor Saki Smilianopoulos, he's from Georgia Institute of Technology. He's going to talk about active uh, distribution system coordinated control method where artificial intelligence. Saki. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Nice to be there, here in a nice place. Um, a nice place in the summer. Uh, uh, today, uh, today, I would like to talk to you about active distribution system coordinated control method via uh, AI methods. Uh, and the previous paper made the point that we really need to close the loop, and uh, I think I will continue with this, um, uh, 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 with this theme. Um, uh, the advent of the smart grid has generated controllable technologies. Uh, that enabled uh, real-time control of distribution systems. And we're talking about active distribution systems today. And uh, uh, we have around the world uh, distribution systems that have uh, uh, megawatts of uh, uh, sources. Uh, some uh, uh, distribution systems in the United States have utility size uh, PVRAs, uh, talking about uh, uh, 30 megawatts on a 35 kV circuit and so on. Uh, so this is happening. Uh, and the projections are that uh, every major utility, we're talking about uh, 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 7 to 10 gigawatts of renewables on the distribution uh, system. Uh, however, the plethora of distributed, distributed energy resources makes the relevant optimization problem large scale and computationable intractable. As a matter of fact, uh, an active feeder uh, with uh, thousands of houses uh, with uh, uh, PV rooftops, uh, uh, smart appliances, and so on, we're talking about an optimization problem that is much larger than what we were used to for the transmission system. Okay? Uh, so artificial intelligence methods uh, uh, offer an alternative uh, that can provide solutions in real time. Yeah. Um, and I would like to uh, 
draw a parallel from the uh, from the eagle, who is in, who is an optimized predator machine. And what the eagle does, it has a dynamic state estimation that can spot a prey up to two miles. Okay? Uh, and uh, uh, if you study uh, the eyesight of the, of the eagle, it's uh, uh, really evolved to a point where basically it is a very effective dynamic state estimation that the, uh, the eagle can know where the prey is and uh, uh, where he is and so on. And once the eagle knows where the prey is, uh, then he plans the attack. So that's the optimization problem. Okay? And uh, uh, people that study the eagles, they, they tell us, uh, uh, first of all, it attacks from the blind side. Uh, and uh, uh, the attacks through a trajectory that is uh, the Vrachistone, uh, 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 Vrachistochronos. Uh, this is a Greek word, so I pronounce it the Greek way. It means that the eagle can uh, get to the, uh, uh, to the prey in minimum time. Okay? Um, now, the problem we have is that, uh, to summarize, the present-day active distribution systems include many utility and customer distributed energy resources. And we're talking about a large optimization problem, uh, which uh, classical methods uh, uh, have an issue with the execution time uh, and so on. Okay? And uh, um, so there are uh, alternative approaches. So basically, we can say that to solve this problem, we can do it either the classical optimization approach, and we've seen a lot of nice papers uh, talking about this, uh, and also uh, artificial intelligence methods that are uh, uh, promising. Okay? So what I'd like to, uh, this paper is about is basically to think about uh, application of artificial uh, intelligence methods uh, to this problem as uh, consisting of three steps. We have the design phase, we have to train whatever models we have, uh, and uh, uh, in order to uh, have accuracy and precision and so on, uh, then uh, uh, we suggest that uh, the best way to do that is to have a detailed, accurate training uh, uh, sets, and uh, this can be generated either with the actual system or with models that are multi-phase, physically based, uh, neutral ground, uh, inclusive, dare inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and uh, then the, uh, uh, in the real-time operation of the system, uh, then we have to recognize that we need to have a way of knowing what's going in the system. Uh, dynamic state estimation, there is a lot of work where we have uh, 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 dynamic state estimation for distribution systems where we can, pre uh, we can uh, determine in real time, what is the operation, operation condition of the system in, uh, uh, in real time and also uh, the model. As a matter of fact, we have projects where we have implemented these methods and they work uh, very nice for the uh, distribution systems. And then, of course, the optimal decision uh, process is advanced uh, AI methods. And basically, uh, in this paper, we propose, uh, based on uh, some work we did, uh, is to have a recurrent uh, new, uh, neural net uh, with uh, uh, model predictive control. Uh, and uh, we had some, uh, we, uh, we investigated uh, several options. And basically, uh, uh, a method that uh, uh, uses attention layers and uh, long, short time uh, memory and so on, they, uh, they provide the best performance uh, to do the optimization. First of all, let's go to the detailed uh, models for uh, creating the data sets. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the interface uh, for uh, a program that we have developed that uh, uh, provides a physically based model for the distribution system, uh, everything inclusive, but with all the controls, the DERs, etc. You can see here in this model, we'll have uh, uh, regulators, uh, PVs, uh, 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 capacitor banks, etc. Uh, and uh, based on the analysis that I'm going to talk about, then uh, we have concluded that basically a, a method that uh, uses as feedback uh, both the state of the, uh, of the system plus the controls of the system uh, through attention layers, and the custom layer there consists of a dense uh, 
LSTM and uh, uh, bidirectional LSTM uh, layer uh, provides the best uh, performance. And uh, uh, in between, you see a concatenation and so on to provide the best controls uh, to optimize the system. Um, we did this work based on optimizing the voltage profile of the distribution system. Okay. Um, and uh, there are some uh, two other alternative approaches there that uh, uh, they perform well, but not as good as the first one that uh, I mentioned to you. Okay. Now, our uh, idea, closing the loop, is to have to do the following thing. That is, as we have the, uh, the physical system here, okay, uh, a dynamic state estimation will monitor continuously the, uh, uh, the system. That is a reality today. Okay? Uh, and therefore, uh, the state estimation will provide both the dynamic model and the uh, operating conditions uh, in real time. Uh, so of course, we can use this uh, applying the uh, AI methods to predict the best controls and control the system. But at the same time, it can provide uh, any events that happen in the system into uh, augmenting the training sets and continuously uh, updating, uh, uh, training the model. Uh, and of course, uh, occasionally, we'll update the model. So this is uh, a way to close the loop. And uh, remember, if we, if we go back to the uh, Eagle example, uh, how many years it took for the Eagle to develop into the, uh, uh, the machine that is today. Uh, it takes a lot of years, and this is this kind of approach provides a perpetual evolution uh, of the model. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about the results. Uh, here is the uh, example test system we, we used. Uh, it is only partly what uh, uh, part of the program of the model that uh, uh, we used. It is a two feeder system. Yeah. Uh, here is the substation. Uh, and of course, this is the transmission uh, system. Obviously, we concentrate on the, on the distribution system. Okay. Uh, and uh, the uh, basic parameters of the system is a total uh, uh, 14 megawatt generation for both of the feeders and some other parameters uh, uh, for this feeder. Okay. Uh, now, when we are doing the analysis, uh, what methods perform better than others and so on, uh, we use the two metrics. One is uh, the mean square error between the uh, uh, predicted by the AI methods uh, for the controls and what was the optimal control. And uh, uh, for the modern predictive uh, uh, control, we measure the efficiency of the distribution system in terms of um, uh, uh, what is the net megawatts of the load supplied versus uh, what was the net megawatt of the resources uh, providing, uh, providing power to the, uh, to the system. Uh, now, I hope, uh, uh, the optimization of the AM methods was on the basis of optimizing the voltage profile because we're using a model predictive uh, uh, control, and basically uh, we set the target uh, states, uh, uh, whatever, from the states, whatever it is voltage, uh, to, to be near the rated voltage of the distribution feeder, and on that basis, we optimize the controls. Yep. Um, so here are some uh, results that uh, uh, for the various options that uh, we used uh, for building the AI model. Uh, uh, you can see here A, B, C, the individual uh, ways of how, uh, what layers we include in, in the model. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess we don't have much time to uh, describe each one of these. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'm showing here is the first iteration of the training, okay, uh, utilizing uh, uh, a set of uh, uh, training data, uh, and then uh, another batch of uh, training uh, data to, uh, doing the second iteration. And what you can see here is that the uh, mean square error improves 
uh, from the first iteration to the second iteration. That is, by continuously evolving the, the model, uh, you get a, a much better performance of the model. Yep. And uh, here is again for the various options, um, uh, the uh, performance in terms of the metric that uh, the mean square error and uh, uh, some of the models uh, uh, C, uh, they provide very poor performance, uh, but the, uh, the one that we recommend that has all these layers here, notice the performance is uh, excellent. Okay? And this is even with the, the training data is not that much for a system like this. Still, the performance was uh, uh, very good. Okay? Uh, in terms of the efficiency, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the, the model was uh, optimizing the voltage profile. But if we look at the uh, efficiency of the system in terms of um, uh, supply megawatts uh, versus load megawatts, uh, you'll notice the one that we recommend, it has an efficiency, which is, well, let's see, uh, that it is 96.26. Um, uh, and this is, uh, basically shows the following thing. We optimize in the voltage, and suddenly the efficiency is uh, quite high. Okay? Uh, so this uh, is something that we know from other, uh, uh, from transmission systems and so on, that uh, optimizing the voltage, uh, basically we increase the efficiency of the system. So to conclude, uh, uh, self-attention outperforms other conventional uh, deep architectures. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in my mind, the self-attention, uh, what it does, it smoothens the data. Uh, so it takes all the, uh, the irrelevant data, okay? Uh, so, I used to be a runner, so I'm going to give you a very good example of what the self-attention uh, is doing, I guess. Uh, when I was running these long runs, uh, 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 30 miles and so on, uh, when I was watching the, uh, the ground, uh, I will uh, black out everything that is uh, on the sides, and I was focused uh, uh, on the, uh, where my feet are going to be landing. So that's a, an attention model. So you, uh, you filter out everything that is outside and you focus on uh, what, is, um, uh, what is coming. Okay? And as a matter of fact, this uh, basically makes uh, uh, these layers, to, uh, the rest of the layers, to perform uh, uh, very well. Uh, so uh, our propose, what we propose is basically to have a recurrent uh, neural net uh, with uh, uh, MPC. Uh, so uh, uh, this enables to optimize the system even when not trained on the intended task, well, that is, with uh, uh, less training. Uh, Self-attention um, uh, neural nets with MPC has potential to provide large-scale coordinated control for active distribution systems. And we're looking now at extensions to have a more direct MPC formulation to account for voltage optimization and also other, uh, uh, other uh, metrics of the system yeah. uh, through reinforcement learning. And um, most, uh, more robust methods to account for noise in real systems, variational methods, and of course the dynamic state estimation for uh, for uh, distribution systems will play a very big role on that. Thank you. So we'll take one question. Yes, uh, Patrick. Right? Yes. Yes, Patrick Monsiatici from RT France. So thank you very much, Sakis, for an interesting presentation. Just to Clarification: What about the topology? If the configuration of the substation change, what do you have to do? do because I, 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 there is no model on the, no graph on the, on the neural network. Do you have to train again everything, or what happened with the substation reconfiguration? Uh, well, uh, the way we prepare the, the data, the model is breaker-oriented model. Uh, so the status of the breakers. Uh, switches and so on is all known because in the distribution system we have uh, very frequent uh, reconfiguration and that's uh, very important. And of course, if we go to, if we close the loop and go to the real time uh, 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 operation, uh, then the distribution state estimation I'm proposing uh, is basically a breaker oriented uh, uh, state estimator and will provide this in real time. Do I answer the, the, your question? Yes, but. I 
you, you claim that you don't need to have this information in the in in machine learning, in the, yeah, in machine learning, there is no input on this information except the status of the breaker. The, no, the connectivity of the graph is not a part of the modeling that you have in a, in a machine learning system. It's just a function that in your, that two voltage could be the same or not. Uh, no, this is part of the system. What is go, goes into the system. Okay, yeah. but we can't speak. So if the, if, the, uh, if the model switches, the physical model switches, that's part of the, of the training. Yeah. Okay. Is that, I'm not sure I, yeah. uh, yes, it, I follow we, the question. We, we couldn't find any solution to, to, to have this uh, neural network without any, any, any information graph to be able to get some topology changes, uh, but perhaps uh, you, you can. We, yeah. we can discuss that at the yeah. panel. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so our next presentation is going to be virtual. Uh, the presenter, uh, Agib Piazara from Texas A&M, will present uh, remotely. And over to you, Agib. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Agib Piazara. I am a PhD candidate at Texas A&M. Uh, before I start, I just want to like to apologize for not being there in person. Uh, due to circumstances uh, that were completely out of my control, I wasn't in a position to travel. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the conference organizers for allowing me to do a virtual presentation. A special thanks to the staff at MAP Center for making all the arrangements uh, for this presentation. Uh, I hope you're having a very good time, and I, as much as I wanted to be there, uh, I could not. So uh, with that, I will uh, start my presentation. Uh, my talk will focus on the problem of uh, statistical load modeling uh, in the context of uh, uh, electric vehicle charging. Uh, so with Elon Musk uh, churning out a thousand electric vehicles uh, a day uh, from his factory here in Austin, Texas, I think this is one area that needs more attention. Uh, here is a presentation outline. Uh, I will cover the brief background on statistical representation of load, essentially talking about uh, how different load types have different probability distributions, and uh, we'll look at the properties of those distributions, uh, and we'll see how electric vehicle charging can disrupt uh, the consumption of uh, energy, and hence uh, change the properties of those probability distributions. Uh, in solutions, we'll talk about an algorithm that can uh, that will allow us to create synthetic EV charging profiles based on uh, the real-world measured arrival rates of EVs. And we'll also talk about uh, a mixture model that can allow us to uh, come up with more accurate fits of uh, the probability distributions of loads impacted by electric vehicle charging. Uh, uh, after that, we'll try to look at some results uh, on EV arrival times, and we'll try to look at some uh, fitting results of the model. And I'll briefly talk about some applications uh, of this work, and then we'll head over to conclusions. So here's the background on statistical load uh, modeling problem. Uh, here on the left, we see two examples uh, of two different load types. We have an annual residential load and we have an annual commercial load. Uh, these are time series, this is time series data. Now, if we try to convert this time series data into a histogram plot uh, to get the density function uh, of the, these two load types, we have uh, the density functions uh, look, uh, have this structure. So uh, the first observation that we can make is that uh, both of these density functions have multimodal uh, uh, features. And that's more apparent in case of a commercial load where we have two distinct modes of, uh, of the density function separated by a range of values that have a very low probability of occurrence. Uh, now, if we would like to come up with a fit to these uh, density functions and for, if, for example, we try to use unimodal uh, density functions, such as uh, we have a, a log normal, Gaussian, a gamma, or a Weibull fit, uh, we'll see that these unimodal distributions, uh, uh, they don't do a very good job at, uh, at fitting these multimodal data. And that's more apparent in case of the commercial load, where you can see that all the unimodal distributions essentially fail to sample from the high density regions where loads are, the load values uh, which have a larger probability of occurrence. 
And uh, the reason is very simple. We're trying to fit a multimodal data with unimodal distributions. And of course, uh, we will not get uh, accurate fits. And the problem is exacerbated when we consider EV charging. Uh, so here is how EV charging impacts uh, these uh, load distribution essentially. So if we take a residential load distribution, a non-EV load distribution, and if we overlay on top of this uh, electric vehicle charging uh, load, the residential electric vehicle charging, we get a distribution that looks uh, like this. So we have, we essentially go from a distribution which had one or two high density regions to a distribution which is now sort of fragmented and has multiple high density regions. And the same thing happens with the commercial load. Uh, when we overlay commercial EV charging on top of the non-EV uh, commercial non-EV load, we get uh, a density function uh, where we have a new high density region appearing because of uh, the commercial EV charging. Uh, so if you're trying to uh, fit uh, these probability distributions, we need a model with enough flexibility so that we can uh, accurately capture all the different modes of these distributions. So that when we try to sample from those distributions, we will be sampling uh, load values with a higher probability of occurrence and rejecting the values that have a low probability of occurrence. Uh, and this has major applications, and then we'll get to applications. I'll briefly touch a couple of applications where this uh, this is important. Uh, now, the first challenge in this lies in how do we develop an electric vehicle charging profile? Uh, so uh, it depends on two factors, essentially. The first factor is the number of electric vehicle arrivals, or what's the EV arrival rate at a certain charging location. And the second important factor is what's the state of charge of the, uh, of the battery uh, of the electric vehicle. Uh, out of these two, the state of charge problem is, uh, is, is a simpler problem to solve, and it has been solved before. Uh, it mostly depends on how many miles were driven and also depends on the efficiency of the electric vehicle. Uh, but a harder problem to solve is how do, you, how do we go from an EV arrival rate uh, to a vector of EV arrival times? So here's an example of uh, a real-world EV arrival rate on two different dates. Uh, so on the x-axis, we are plotting time. On the y-axis, we are plotting the average number of EVs per hour that are uh, queuing up at a charging station to receive charging service. So uh, on this particular day, we have a high, high number of EVs, a large number of EVs uh, queuing up early in the early hours. And then there is a sudden drop in the number of EVs at the charging station. And there is another peak in the, in the afternoon. And on, on, the, on a different day, we, have, we don't have enough EVs uh, receiving charging service in the morning hours, but there is a peak uh, in the afternoon. An important takeaway from these two figures is that the arrival rate of EVs is, is time dependent. So as we move progress throughout the day, the, number, the average number of EVs uh, at a charging station uh, uh, has a time dependence. And if we want to develop an EV charging profile, that profile must uh, take into account this time dependency of EV arrivals. So what we want to do here is we want to take this uh, measured real-world EV arrival rate data and somehow we want to do some processing and come up with an EV charging profile. Uh, so the way we do that is we first try to get a vector of EV arrival times and if we have some knowledge about the EV arrival times, from those EV arrival times we can make a reasonable estimation of how many electric vehicles are received charging on that particular day or a particular week or even could be a particular year. And when we have a reasonable estimation of the number of EVs that were lining that received charging service and based on their battery characteristics, their performance, uh, we can uh, come up with an EV charging profile uh, with a time with the planning horizon of uh, either a day or a week or even a year. Uh, and the way we do that in this work is we uh, use a thinning algorithm, which is a, a variation of an acceptance rejection sampling method. So essentially what we do is we take a real world measured arrival rate data. And from that, we first try to develop uh, the arrival times. We try to simulate the arrival times of a homogeneous Poisson process. Uh, so essentially the algorithm works in two steps. In the first step, we derive the arrival times of a homogeneous Poisson process. And this, this is easy to do because we know that the interarrival times of homogeneous Poisson process, they have an exponential distribution. So using that knowledge, we can generate a vector of arrival times. 
And once we have a vector of arrival times from a homogeneous boson process, uh, we accept some of those arrival times and reject some of those arrival times until we have, uh, based on the acceptance probability, until we end up with a vector, uh, which is a subset of the original vector that we started with. And, uh, and that vector would give us the arrival times of uh, the non-homogeneous Poisson process. Now, there is an analytical proof to this, but I think a visual illustration uh, makes it more intuitive. Uh, for example, uh, we are considering here, we have a blue curve and we have the red dotted curve. The blue curve has a time varying intensity weight and the red curve has a constant intensity weight. So the blue curve represents our non-homogeneous Poisson process while well, the red curve represents our homogeneous boson process. So when we simulate the arrival times of a homogeneous boson process, uh, uh, you can see those uh, given by the black circles here. Uh, we only accept the ones uh, that are the print process, so the ones essentially that are below this uh, intensity weight function. Uh, and, so, and, and that gives us a, a vector of uh, simulated arrival times. Now, if we do a comparison between our simulated values and the actual recorded arrival times, here's a comparison. Uh, this is the a pre recorded arrival times, uh, and this is our simulated arrival times. Uh, there is a certain degree of similarity between the simulated values and the, and the actual recorded values. And of course, there are differences uh, because uh, the major source of this difference is that uh, these are come from two different locations of the two different arrival rates. But overall, we can get a pretty good reasonable estimate of the arrival times of EVs. And once we have the vector, we can use that to create uh, the EV charging profiles, which we can then overlay on top of the non-electric vehicle load. Now, the second problem that we're trying to address is to come up with a model fit, which will, uh, which can, we already saw that uh, the EV impacted load has a multimodal distribution. So we want to come up with a more accurate fit to that distribution. And one way to do that is to use a probability mixture model. And here is one example of what a mixture model looks like. We have the blue PDF, which is the full component mixture model, and the dotted components, uh, the dotted PDFs, they are the components that make up the model. So these components, they have their own set of parameters, and there is a weight that is associated with each component. And by adjusting those weights and by adjusting the parameters of these uh, dotted PDFs, uh, we can model a large variety of statistical behaviors. Now the problem becomes, how do we determine the weights of each of these components and how do we determine the parameters of these components so that we can do, those, uh, do that tweaking and uh, represent any sort of load distribution that we have. Uh, and and uh, the answer lies in, uh, in formulating the law of likelihood function of this model, uh, which has a form such as this. And in this form, uh, our challenge here is to evaluate the set of parameters, psi, which contains the weights and the parameters of the individual components. Uh, so we, want, we like to maximize the log likelihood function, but a way, one way to maximize it is using, uh, is uh, formulating this problem as uh, a maximization of expectation of this problem. So what we essentially do is we are using uh, the expectation maximization uh, algorithm to maximize the expectation of the log likelihood. Essentially, we have um, on the horizontal axis, we have the parameter space, and on the vertical axis, we have the log likelihood function given by the blue curve. So we try to, we start with the initial guess uh, of, of our parameters, and using that initial guess, we construct a lower bound shown by the orange curve here. And uh, this lower bound has two properties. One that it's lower bound uh, to the blue curve throughout this parameter space. And uh, the other properties is that it touches the blue curve uh, at the current value of the estimates. So once we have this orange curve, uh, we try to maximize the orange curve and that and the point where that uh, touches the blue curve gives us the next estimates. And we keep on doing this until the maximum of the orange curve also is equal to the maximum of the blue curve. At that point, the algorithm stops and we get the parameters of our mission model. And then we can uh, take, we, we take the input data and we can use those uh, parameters to construct a variety of probability, uh, probability distributions. And uh, here are the results of, uh, of this algorithm. So on the left, we see the annual residential distribution without considering EV charging. And you can see that the mixture model accurately is able to uh, account for all the different modes of this distribution. 
And when we do consider EV charging, we have a very strange looking distribution with uh, multiple modes. And the mixture model is still able to accurately account for all of these different modes. And this, uh, the same thing happens with a commercial load distribution. Again, we see that our mixture model fit uh, accurately identifies different modes of this distribution. And when we do consider EV charging, uh, the results are still accurate. Uh, uh, and if you want to uh, look at how, now, now I said before that the mixture model uh, consists of several components and uh, deciding upon how, much, how many components we need is, is a difficult problem uh, with no open-ended solution. So what we do is we start with one component and keep on adding components until we minimize an error function. So in this case, uh, if you look at the mean square error between the empirical, the observed data and the model fit, after uh, four, ha adding four components, uh, we are sort of minimizing the mean square error function and the fifth component does not really add anything to, to the model. So that's, that's a good metric uh, and a good indication of where we should stop uh, with the number of components. Uh, so as far as the applications of this model are concerned, uh, one major application is in the area of distribution state estimation, uh, uh, particularly in the case of distribution systems where metered measurements are very limited. Uh, and, uh, and with EV charging loads, we have seen that uh, the load data is no longer normally distributed. So one assumption that we make in the state estimation process is that the pseudo measurements that we often use because of limited measurements, uh, the pseudo measurements have normal distribution which we have seen that is not, uh, cannot be justified. So by using this method, we can actually sample uh, pseudo measurements from the mixture model and ones that, will, that can better represent uh, the load distribution and can give us a more enhanced observability of the distribution of the state estimation process. And the other important application lies in time series forecasting. Uh, 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 the, the usual ARMA model that is used to forecast uh, uh, loads, for example, uh, has an assumption that the error terms have a normal distribution. Again, we've seen that the normal distribution, uh, uh, the assumption that is not really justified, particularly in the case of distribution networks where different load types can have dis different distributions. So essentially replacing that normal assumption with a mixture model assumption, we can draw more accurate samples of the error terms and get a better idea of the means and variances of these error terms, and, and as a consequence, get a better estimate of the forecasted load at any time step t. Uh, other applications also include uh, probabilistic load flow studies, where we consider the uncertainty of inputs, the uncertainty with associated with loads with the distributed generation, uh, uh, to, to get a better idea of uh, in the areas of, for example, planning and reliability studies. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll head over to conclusions. Uh, uh, major conclusions include that the EV charging uh, introduces random peaks in our load distribution. Uh, so to account for those random peaks, we first uh, uh, we first try to create uh, a synthetic EV charging profile based on the arrival rates. To do that, we use a thinning algorithm. And once we have the EV charging profiles, we use a mixture model that can accurately model uh, 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 a large uh, variety of statistical behaviors and can then, and then from those models, we can sample load values uh, that better represent the uncertainty uh, in the loads as well as in the distributed generation. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we will take one question for Agip. Is there any question from the audience? Sure. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. So, with the uh, using the mixture of models, and as you, as you said, you know, you keep adding the components, and at some point you say, okay, this is the adding of it uh, basically does not give you any additional value or yield. So, this is like basically in neural networks when we add neurons, and basically at some point we decide, okay, there's no need to add more neurons, but sometimes we just build um, a large neural network and then we start pruning. So uh, on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, with regard to the pruning, of, now you, let's say you have an, a, a number of Gaussian mixture model here, and how do you, you know, is there a possibility to 
simplify the model? Do you go backward and say, you know, we can now have a much simpler model? You know, you're building it and then you're basically pruning it. Have you thought about that kind of approach where you can have much simpler models? You know, it looks complicated, but can you derive simple models? So, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question properly because of, uh, I think there's a, there was a lot of noise. But, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you asked about uh, uh, comparison with simpler models uh, and how a big model will perform. Yeah, you, you could have a very rich over, you know, uh, it's an overkill model, but can you have, do you have an approach to derive simpler models from the approach that you described, the mixture? For, for the different, you know, you have commercial, you have residential EVs, and that, you know, I think, maybe we can take it at the panel, or I can just email it. Again, I'm really sorry. I, I, I can't hear the words clearly, but I will, uh, as far as simpler models are concerned, uh, is, uh, uh, I showed earlier that simpler models often lead, will lead to long estimations of the load because they will fail to sample from regions where, uh, which have a higher probability of occurrence. So, for example, uh, consider uh, a, a commercial load, and if we have a unimodel fit, these are these are very simple models, computationally very uh, very efficient, but at the same time the their means occur at points where uh, which are, uh, they cover a range of values which have a very low probability of occurrence. So if you're doing state estimation or if you're trying to run Monte Carlo simulations with trying to generate multiple scenarios, will essentially be generating more scenarios uh, from the region which has a very low probability of occurrence. So essentially ignoring all the highly more probable outcomes of the load. And if uh, and any application designed uh, on this uh, will lead to a wrong conclusion unless we don't adequately capture load values with more, uh, with a higher probability of upwards uh, than those with a, with a very low probability of upwards. I'm sorry if I didn't answer because I couldn't clearly hear the words. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I think. Uh, uh, we would like to invite all the panel uh, the speakers to come uh, to the front here and so that we can start our panel discussion. And I give you will stay online here yeah, for the discussion. <coughs> so maybe, Masutu, um, why don't you come up? Okay, all right. All right, so I think uh, we will open up for the questions and uh, comments from all of you here. Yes, if you can get to the microphones, there are two microphones, one on the side, left and one on right. And um, if you can kindly introduce yourself, uh, your name and where you're from, and then sure. Yeah, Shmuel Orn from UC Berkeley. I actually want to follow up on your question uh, with uh, the last speaker. Shouldn't the decision of what kind of estimation you should use take into consideration the decision that you are trying to make? I mean, some, some estimation, you know, for some decisions, you don't need to have all this granularity. So making approximations and estimating statistical estimation of data in, without putting in the context of decision making doesn't make sense to me, especially not in engineering uh, context. So, Agib, can you, did you hear the question? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question properly, but... Uh... Well, you want me to repeat it? <laughs> I'm asking if you don't seem to take into consideration the decision that you are going to use these models for. So if the question is about uh, uh, the, the complexity of the models being used here where uh, in situations where we could get easier, simpler answers by using simpler models, uh, why to invest uh, uh, enough, uh, a large amount of computational resource to 
to, to develop these models. Uh, is that is that the correct question, sir? Or um, yeah, maybe you know it's like a doc a doctor doing a very elaborate uh, testing when uh, the only means that he has to offer to the customer is two aspirins and go to sleep. So what's the point of the testing? So, uh, uh, so this is very application specific. Uh, uh, these are very application specific models and, and particularly in cases where we are uh, looking at a very high accuracy. For example, I can give you a quick example on, uh, for example, uh, if you're trying to solve a hosting capacity problem of, of distributed generation, uh, while looking at uh, 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 while looking at the violation of operation constraints, uh, now solving that problem, and if you if you also want to factor in economic constraints such as let's say, you know, uh, a carbon tax policy on uh, on on the amount of carbon emitted in the atmosphere, now that that's a that's a problem where uh, a wrong uh, estimation of the loads. Uh, can lead to heavy losses to the utilities in terms of how much carbon can or can they not emit and how much they can invest in solar generation. So problems such as those where you require very precise answers or where you want to minimize the uncertainty of outputs, particularly you know, in, in hosting capacity problems or also problems where you want to size uh, uh, you know, power electronic converters, for example. That, that's that's a, that's another problem where manufacturers don't exactly know what should be the capacity of their converters to, you know, uh, when they are interfaced with distribution networks. So in those areas where you want to sort of minimize the uncertainty of the outputs by running those Monte Carlo simulations, these, these modeling approaches uh, are more suitable where, in, in those areas. Now, of course, in, uh, if you look at transmission systems, uh, the assumption of a normal distribution is mostly satisfied. It's most it's a reasonable assumption to make. And if you look at how the transmission system loads are distributed, normal uh, the assumption of a normal uh, uh, distribution gives you reasonable results. And that's uh, but in case of distribution networks where you have different load types with different uh, energy consumption patterns, or residential uh, loads have a different uh, consumption pattern as compared to commercial loads. So you have these. Uh, a wide variety of distributions uh, for uh, for loads. In, in those areas, uh, you might want to have a more precise, uh, more precise, more accurate information about how each individual load uh, is distributed so that you can better uh, solve problems such as hosting capacity or sizing power electronic converters. Okay. I, I hope I answered the question. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Some other questions, comments? Yes. We'll start with uh, Antonio. Please come to the microphones if you have questions. That way we can just get, I know who is next. Yes. Antonio Simões Costa, Federal University of Santa Catarina, Brazil. My question goes to you, Kumar. OK. Uh, about your, um, uh, I mean, the question is, how will you compare your data-driven uh, substation uh, identification, uh, substation configuration identification okay. methods, with uh, generalized state estimation, as a uh, that mind refresher, generalized state estimation started in the, the 90s, and uh, it, it uh, considers uh, the, the through variables. I mean, uh, power flows and currents as uh, additional state uh, additional state state variables, and then uh, uh, generalized state estimation uses well-consolidated estimation methods to identify topology uh, along with uh, uh, state, uh, the conventional state variables. Yeah. So which, what advantages <coughs> your approach yeah. would uh, have a concern so, so our next step is to do state estimation with the bus um, uh, branch models, you know, the network topology. But at this point in time, we are only building the substation configuration. Usually, I think the state of the art is the breaker status is communicated with SCADA. But here we are saying, can we use the work is basically presented how we can use voltage and current measurements to infer the substation 
configuration to help us build the bus branch model, eventually build the network transmission topology, which can be used in state estimation. But what I'm saying is that um, generalized state estimation does exactly what you okay. do with your data-driven methods. So um, <coughs> I just want to know if you, if you foresee any advantages of using these uh, data-driven methods with respect to, to, to with uh, consolidated think, estimation methods. Yes, it definitely is redundancy, high speed, so we can use PMU data, uh, whatever, and even point of waveform, you know, so whatever that speed is. So I think as we move towards more inverter-based uh, resources, uh, more, we will need uh, more frequent reconfiguration and then having a high-speed network topology, real-time network topology processor is the motivation. Okay. Yes. I just yeah, I just want to add that. And I uh, think we will be comparing that. We may, you know, we are very early, as I said, okay. stated. We'll be comparing that with the current state of the art. But okay. definitely, the biggest That's benefit the biggest. we see is from data. We can get um, high-speed, real-time network topology processor. And of course, we have to identify uh, applications will emerge where that would require frequent reconfiguration. Wherever we can see that we can frequent. Mm -hmm. We can mm -hmm. reconfigure the network frequently to, for a higher value, I think, uh, then I think we can make a case for that. Yeah, uh, I just want to add that uh, this generalized state estimation is able to do this in real time. So uh, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to see this comparison. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we'll go here and then we'll go to Claudia. Spiros from DTU. Uh, 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 Maybe I would like to follow a bit on, on what Antonio said. The, my question goes mostly to, to you, Kumar and Sakis. Um, so a disclaimer is that I am a co-author of uh, jo Johan's paper. Um, and so do you, do you think, so you, we, we are working on machine learning methods. Do you think that these methods that we all present are going to be trusted by, by the industry as, as they are? Uh, so for example, for the substation configuration, would, would an operator trust uh, this neural network to be able to identify what the configuration is, or, or do we need to do something about it? Because we discuss about verification, so we are a bit biased towards something, towards trustworthiness. But your interaction with the industry, would they trust these models? And if they, if, if they don't, then what, what should we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Sakis, you want to go first, and then I will go. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, let me answer the question together with the bonus uh, question, I guess. I think the microphone. Can you please make sure this switch on? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Is this working? Yeah, it's working. Uh, it's better. Okay. Um, one thing we can tell immediately about comparison state estimation and uh, 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 artificial intelligence methods to determine the topology is that in general, in state estimation, if we do it uh, uh, in a certain way where we utilize all the data, then we can uh, 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 we can have more confidence about the uh, network topology. As a matter of fact, we can express the, uh, our confidence about the network topology probabilistically. You can say with 99% uh, probability this is the, uh, the topology. But of course, the uh, data-based methods, as uh, artificial intelligence methods, have the advantage that you don't have to have an associated model with that. Okay? Uh, so there are pros and uh, uh, and consider. Uh, uh, now, uh, the question if the operators trust this, uh, uh, my experience is that they do. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there are not many installations that uh, will utilize the generalized state estimation or uh, advanced state estimation methods that uh, 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 the operators will have confidence because the traditional state estimators, legacy state estimators, uh, they can, uh, they don't have the ability to determine all the errors in real time. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's growing, I guess, and uh, we have uh, a number of uh, 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 pilot programs and the operators uh, like that. Yeah, I think uh, with time, uh, I think the confidence will grow, and I think when you can validate the results provided by the AI methods with other techniques, the current state of the art, and you know, all the time you are, I think time will tell, right? If the time, the confidence grows. Uh, so this is something that has to go into the industry and industry uses it as a 
back up for some time and then confidence grows. And there will be times when the AI method is uh, on spot and uh, the current method fails. So I think you know, time with time we will evolve. I think you know, it's not going to be an overnight thing that the industry just uh, accepts this technology. And I think, uh, I think the, one of the presentations also establishing having a community that can establish standards and I think that also will uh, help us to get there for the industry to accept that, you know, but yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting time for AI and I think AI methods to, to be formalized, if I may use that word, yeah. So if I want to follow up, the, the, one of the challenges of the AI methods compared to the first, first principles based, right, is that they have adversarial examples. And sometimes you might, you, you don't know where these actually are hidden. Uh, while with, a, with an analytic, analytical, let's say, methods, then you can predict that at least in this region it will uh, work as a, as a one. <coughs> yeah, so yeah, definitely I think, you know, AI has been viewed as in the past or even uh, today by many as black box, but there's a whole community now in AI working on AI explainability, right? Yes. So we want to explain why the result was this, and if the result is this, this is what you get from it. So, whether, so there, you know, so uh, if you just, take software tools just like MacLab uh, neural networks and use that, you don't know what's it's hidden. You don't know what's going on. But if you actually construct it yourself, uh, you'll be able to say at every step why this result came. So I, I personally, I say AI and neural networks are not black box because after you train them, you have a mathematical equation which you can write down, right? For every neural network, there is a mathematical equation. If you can write that equation down and you just implement that equation, mathematical equation, it's actually the same thing as the neural network. So you use neural network to get the equation. Yes, right? then explainable AI, yeah. yeah. that, that yeah. can be, yeah. Yes, and Claudia, and then I think we'll take the question. Uh, thank you. Claudia Canizaz, University of Waterloo. Interesting the comment you made at the end because we have done that with optimization. So we have developed a neural network and introduced a lot model within the optimization problem. And it's basically an equation. Yes. It might be complex, complicated, but it works. We have done this with, with uh, introducing a stability into optimization and dispatch. So that's a, that's a valid argument. My question was really for Sakis, and, and I don't know whether if I understood correctly. So you said that you have a set of data, but you also use a model to generate more data, correct? Now, my question regarding that is that how, how much you trust your model? My problem is that your model has limitations, right? I mean, we've done the same. But the question comes from whoever we are interacting is, well, how good is that model? Is it going to really produce valuable data? Or are you putting some bias? Are you really modeling the real thing? Because it might be too complicated. How useful is that? So and how, I guess the same question, how, how much you trust these results? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, notice in the diagram that I showed you, uh, we prefer that the model comes from the state estimator. Uh, so if it comes from the state estimator, I can trust it in terms of uh, a probability. That is, the state estimator tells me that this is the model, and you can trust it with so much uh, uh, probability. Um, so what we have seen from the installations of the uh, state estimator in distribution systems, that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the model can be trusted. Yeah. Fair enough. I guess you have a, a, a model you have validated. Now, my follow-up question is, since you mentioned that, I was thinking, well, if you are, if you, in all of these problems with uh, or AI is that if you do not, if your data doesn't capture the problem, then it's not very reliable, so you might not be very useful. And, and that's a question of how much data you have, how big your network it is, is it is, and then get things get more complicated, right? I mean, example is Tesla driving, right? Auto driving. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so in that context, uh, how do you see utilities trusting these results, saying, well, have you really captured all of what I need? Especially in extrapolation, right? Yeah. Um, so. Well, the, the perpetual question, if the utilities trust these models, that's uh, too early to answer this, uh, uh, because uh, the, uh, the activity on uh, uh, 
state estimation distribution systems is pretty new, I guess, that is uh, maybe 10 years and so on. Um, so it's going to take it, uh, uh, quite some time, and also it will take some time for utilities to in install all the required hardware to do that. Uh, however, there are uh, two things that are driving the industry right now. The, uh, the number of distributed energy resources on the distribution system, uh, it, uh, it uh, forces the utilities uh, to introduce uh, the hardware that will have complete observability of the distribution system. We're almost uh, in, uh, in many distribution feeders. We are there. Okay. Uh, so it's going to take a while, but I think uh, eventually uh, utilities will be trusting this, uh, these models. Yeah, to add to that, too, uh, I think, you know, definitely uh, we don't have to just completely rely on training data set for AI uh, models. We can also use the physics uh, of whatever we are modeling to start off with that. So you can have a hybrid model that initially is built from the physics and then uh, between the model and the uh, real world uh, implementation, you, ha you can use data to fill in that to improve your model, to refine your model. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I love this discussion of trustworthy AI in power systems. Uh, I, I hope we'll continue on Thursday, uh, but kind of few follow up and maybe a little bit of provocation. Um, well, uh, we discuss explainability, right? Mm -hmm. So explainability is a part of being trusted. Yeah. But uh, there is also reproducibility, which, which yeah. we also discussed. Sure. Uh, and, um, well, was this overkill model discussion, right? Uh, one way to um, reinforce this um, reproducibility is uh, uh, to create a map. So you have whatever number of uh, characteristics you're interested in, and it, of course, depends on, on application. Well, for example, it may be number of samples and accuracy, right? So just to simplify two-dimensional space. And then different models. Some of them are very black boxy, some are very physics in form, and some <coughs> traditional power system models. They will be performing very differently in this, uh, well, two-dimensional space. And of course, it's not two-dimensional, it's m much more. You know, high dimension. And uh, they will be overlapping. And whenever models are overlapping, well, trust is there too, because, well, we, if they, they more or less give, give similar results, so that's, that seems to be good. So I, I think we should, uh, uh, we're excited about AI. We're excited to focus on a particular AI model, uh, but we should consider much, well, not one. Uh, sure. Well, a better 10. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess I guess it's uh, just maybe some, yeah, yeah, adding or summarizing some of that. I'm glad that you are excited about AI models. <laughs> um, yeah. So we I have what is known as ensembles, right? We use ensembles, so, so we can develop so many AI a family of AI models that forms an ensemble, and the ensemble performance is better than a single model. Yeah. yeah. I agree yeah. with you. And maybe maybe add one extra thing. Uh, um, well, another side of this trustworthiness may be preparedness, right? And well, um, extrapolation, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which was mentioned, or even um, uh, being prepared for events which never happen in the past, right? Uh, that's actually also interesting opportunity because a traditional power system, or for that matter, any traditional engineering, uh, don't know what to do about that at all, right? And I have some potential. Uh, so that's maybe also what we should discuss. Something which we never uh, see, but maybe can imagine. And AI, AI is actually pretty good. Much, well, yeah. as good as it can be because there is not much we can do usually. Can I sure, go ahead. Can, uh, so about these extreme events, or I think we have to be very, very careful actually about uh, yeah the, the far tile in our distributions uh, that these unlikely events that we never see, if we trust any machine learning algorithm actually there. From a statistical point, I wouldn't trust that just because uh, it might. If I have never seen it, 
it's pure luck if the machine learning model has a good extrapolation uh, capacity in that area or not. So I'm not suggesting to, to trust, ex I mean, uh, uh, well, there are some other uh, techniques which may, may allow you, well, you need to make guess. Uh, and uh, I'm not suggesting to, to use automatic uh, machine learning. Actually, in this regard, I don't know, psychology, if operator sign wall to human sign wall, to maybe our system experience will be much more useful. Yeah. Can I add something? Yes, okay. Uh, well, you brought up the issue of repeatability. Okay. Uh, and uh, here in this session, we're talking about the uh, distribution system, active distribution systems, and so on. I would like to remind you that uh, in any distribution management system, one of the basic functions is uh, uh, feeder reconfiguration. So this means we, the model changes continuously. Now, AI methods do not have to be static. Okay, not, they, they don't have to be, uh, uh, we train it, we have a model, and that's, uh, 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 they can be dynamic. Uh, 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 recurrent uh, uh, neural nets to uh, couple with uh, MPC, they can provide this dynamic approach to the AI models. Uh, so all you have to do is feed it back to what is going on in real time. So, so we should think it in terms of AI as dynamic methods, not uh, static. I think that's a good thing, dynamic. So with that statement, let's get to our break and continue the discussions at the break. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you.